right, everybody can be seated. Thank you so much. Um, you want this right here? Yeah. Before we get started, uh, I think that uh, who here has who here has a uh, a mentor, a coach? Who here has ever played any sports and they've been coached by somebody that may have some information, may have some development a little bit more than yourself? Yes. Uh, I've had the honor and the blessing to have a mentor for, my first mentor was with me for about 19 years. My second mentor has been with me for eight years. So I'm very, very big on mentoring and submitting to mentorship. And my mentor once said, he said, he said, you never know how far reaching what you may say, think, or do today will affect the lives of millions tomorrow. It is better to light one candle than to curse the darkness. Get the big idea and all else will follow. I think Pastor Mauricio gave us a big idea today. So sometimes you're around people that you may think have it going on and sometimes we don't really give them the prayers and the support because we're always looking at the, at the underdog, right? We're always looking at the person that's struggling. And for me, it's very important for us to always uplift the leadership and the leader. So could you give Pastor Mauricio a huge round of applause, please? Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, 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 I listen to speakers every day, every single day, and I'm always looking for the, the golden nugget. I'm always looking for the pearl of wisdom, and you gave us five amazing pearls of wisdom, and I thank you for that, for, for that very much. Who here has ever heard me speak in the past? Okay, I thought I was more popular than this. Okay, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so let, let, let me, if you, with, your, with your, your permission, let me share uh, my testimony just a little bit. My mentor said this. He said, your influence and your impact is directly proportional to your self-identity. I repeat this again. He said, your influence and your impact is directly proportional to your self-identity. So, I'm a little old school. I, I love to write on an eraser board. That's how one of my coaches taught me. Name uh, a gentleman by the name of Jim Rohn. I don't know if you're. I don't know if you're. Okay. Oh, not not the not the not the sports guy, Jim Rohn. Yeah, not, <laughs> not the other Jim Rohn. Yes. So he said, your influence and your impact is directly proportional to your self identity. See, you may feel blessed right now, as I do. You may feel that things are going great, and I feel things are going great also, but things haven't always been going great. My parents migrated from a very, very small country in Central America by the name of, uh, I mean, by the name of El Salvador. And they, any Salvadorians here? Any? Yeah. Okay, there's always one or two in the group. There's always one, yes. And... Um, when they migrated to, to the United States, they landed in one of the most beautiful parts of sunny Southern California called South Central Los Angeles. You made it out. Okay, I appreciate that. I, you know, it's, hot, it's tough. It's tough, yes. And um, in South Central Los Angeles, it was very, very difficult. And most of our greatest lessons comes through challenges and trials, right? So um, I didn't know how bad it was because... When you're poor, but you've always been, been poor, then poverty is just what you know. When you live in scarcity, and you've always lived in scarcity, and you're born into scarcity, then scarcity is all you know. But I did know this as a very young man. I knew when the end of the month was, because my parents would always argue more during the end of the month. And they always argued more towards the end of the month because there was always less money at the month, right, than days there were. Uh, my father was a functional alcoholic. Uh, my best days, my most fun days were Monday because he had to go to work. Friday, Saturday, and Sundays were terrible because I knew he was going to drink. So I wasn't gifted being 6'3 and being able to run a, a 40 and 4'3. So I knew that athleticism wasn't going to get me out of the ghetto. So I, I didn't know what to do. And I remember one day coming to my mom, I was eight years old, and I said, Mom, I said, I don't want to be poor when I grow up. I, I want something different. My mom only has a fifth grade education. My dad has a sixth grade education. So that day we were in downtown Los Angeles and 
my mom stopped this man, and he was a tall, handsome man, blue eyes, blonde hair. And in her broken English, she says, what is the key to success? And he, without hesitation, he said the key to success is education. I was about eight years old. I was really, really small, big head, really, really small kid. And I looked up at him, and I said, education? And at, I know I still have a big head. And at the, at the age of eight, I fell in love with learning. So I became an avid student. I still learn. Every day, seven days a week, I study anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour every single day, right? So I fell in love with learning, and I started learning, and I started doing well in school. And uh, I had a teacher in second grade. I had struggled in a, in a public school, and somehow my parents moved me to a private school. I don't know how they, they paid for this private school, but it was the first day of school, and in my, in my public school, I just didn't want to go to school anymore. And when I was in second grade, I missed about 93 days of school just because I didn't want to go anymore. And I'd get myself all worked up and I'd throw up constantly when I was in second grade. So my mom and my dad back then before the HMOs and PPOs, there was, there was something called indemnity and insurance. Everyone had great insurance. They took me to all these psychologists and, and what was going on. And one said, well, why don't you switch them school? So they switched me school. And they put me in this school called St. Cecilia. If you know South Central, it's on, it's on Normandy and 47th. And so we went to that school, and I remember my mom was walking me. It was about a mile walk, and she was walking me to school. She had tears coming down her cheeks. She says, Louis, you have to stay in school. I said, Mom, I'm not going to go to school anymore. I don't need school. I think I've learned everything I need to learn. I'm in second grade. I, I, I got this. She said, she, said, she said, no, no, you have to stay in school. And she, we got to the class, and we walked in, and my mom said, my, my mom said I'm about to leave. I said, I said mom, if, if you leave, you know what's going to happen, right? She says, please, don't, don't throw up. And I had even created this rhyme. I said, if your hand hits the door, the vomit hits the floor, right? And she said, no. She said, and so I got myself in position because I had done it so many times. I got myself in position, and as soon as, Right before I made myself sick again, the door in the back opened up. Guess who came in through the door in the back? Take a wild guess. Huh? It was, the <laughs> it was my second grade teacher. And I was looking at my mom, and my second grade teacher came in, and all I heard someone say was, are you Louis Ariaza? So I, I'm in, I, I have flunked second grade. So I'm, I'm standing there in this position, and I look over, and all I see was this tall, slender woman. Almond-shaped eyes, olive skin tone, long, flowing hair. I think she was like half black, half white. You know, they come out fine like that, right, you know? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I don't know. I'm happily married, but I was seven years old, and she was fine. And I looked at her. And then I look back at my mom, and then I look at her. I said, Mom, you can go to work. <laughs> and she said, Louis, I want you to sit right here in front of me. And I sat right in front of her. She said, Louis, can you pass out these tests? I said, Miss Steptoe, it, it would be my pleasure. And passed out all. Can you pass out these books? That day I ran home. I said, Mom, I love school. She said, No, you love your, your teacher. I said, <laughs> I said that too, but I, I love. So Miss Steptoe and I, we just had this wonderful relationship. And, uh, Towards the end of the school year, she says, I need to talk to your mom and dad. So my parents came. They're really upset because if you know the, 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 the Latino generation, the immigrants, they, it's all about work. They don't miss work for anything. Everything's work, 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 work. And they didn't even have good jobs. My parents, the, the, their net income per month was $800 a month. Of course, this is about 45 years ago. And uh, Ms. Stepto said, you know, your son has done very, very well. Actually, your son is the number one uh, kid academically in our second grade and we want to give him a test so he can go from second to fourth but we need your permission so mom was like sure I took the test I passed the test so now they had to come back and they said well the, the, the question is would you allow him to go from second to fourth grade and my parents said well if you think it's best yes so she says but what we need for you to do during the summers you need, we need for you to read to him right 
I knew my mom and dad couldn't read, but my mom's like, yeah, I'll read to them, right? And then my mom's like, well, what do, where do, I, where do I read? And my step told, it, you know, when I was eight years old, now, it seemed like she pulled out this gigantic book, but it was probably small, but it, it looked gigantic, and it was a Bible for the first time. And she just opened it up to my verse, probably your verse also, Jeremiah 29, 11. And she read it. She says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a bright future. And the word that popped out to me was prosper. And I said, Mom, I said, what? I, I said, Miss Steptoe, I said, what does prosper mean? She said, prosper means to be wealthy, but not just financially, but be wealthy in life, be wealthy in love, be wealthy in happiness, be wealthy in health, be wealthy in riches. And I said, why are my parents broke? I'll never forget what she said. She says, because they don't believe. She says, because to the person that believes, she says, all things are possible. She says, not some things are possible. Not once in a while things are possible. Not one time things are possible. She says, all things are. And I, I was eight years old, but that was the beginning. That was the beginning to my self-identity. So I started walking in this space thinking, you know, I, 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 I can. And I got through school. I got through my undergrad, went to graduate school, graduated as a second youngest doctor of chiropractic in my class, the only Latino in my class. And they threw me a big, big party. And, and after the party the next day, I knocked on my mom's door. And I said, Mom, I said, that man, that tall man with blue eyes and blonde hair, 17, 18 years ago, he says, he lied to us. She said, what do you mean? I said, I'm more broke as a doctor than I was prior. I'm like $250,000 in debt, my school loan. I said, what do we do now? She said, I don't know. So I did maybe what you guys do. I went into my room, got on my knees. I was 24 years old, and I said, Lord, I, 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 didn't, I didn't pray. I didn't pray for, uh, for, for me to hit the lottery. I didn't pray for that. I didn't pray to marry a woman who was wealthy. I didn't pray. For, I thought about it, but I didn't pray for that. <laughs> but it did, it did cross my mind a couple of times. What I prayed was for someone to come into my life that had what I needed. Um, what I've learned in my last 30, 35 years of being in business and being around people and learning the psychology of people is that your greatest gifts from God will come through the lives of other people. So it's really, you, you got to be really, really careful who you surround yourself with because your greatest blessings can come by the person who invited you today. Your greatest blessings can come by the person you're going to call today. So I was invited to this seminar and, um, and I, I went, the seats in front were $500, the seats in the middle were 250 the seats in the back were $50 and I, I sat in seats in the back because I had no money. And as this person took the stage, he was a tall man, dark, very handsome, very big, very muscular, projected his voice very powerfully. And I just felt God almost audibly tell me that that is the person that has what you need. I waited for him. He kissed all the babies, signed all the autographs. And I approached him. And I said, sir, I said, doctor, I said, you don't know who I am, but I'm, I'm, you have what I'm looking for. And I'm willing to do everything you ask me to do, as long as it is ethically, morally, and theologically correct. I'll do whatever you ask me to do. I will commit, com I'll completely submit to you. And he looked at me, pulled out his card, gave, him, gave me his card. He said, call me Monday. I called him Monday. He didn't take my call. Called him Wednesday. He didn't take my call. Called him Friday. He didn't take my call. Called him all next week, he didn't take my call. Called him for six months, he never took my call. Finally, in the seventh month, the phone rang. I was with a patient. My office manager came, she said, hey, that, that doctor that never calls you back, he's on the phone. I said, oh my goodness, I adjusted my patient, I ran to my office. I said, doc, he said, Luis, because he'd always call me Luis. He said, Luis? I said, yes. He said, I'm ready. I said, Doc, I've, I've been waiting for your call. 
He says, that's a good thing. Waiting is a good thing sometimes. I said, okay. I said, um, I said, what's our first step? He says, you have to agree to one condition. I said, doc, what's the condition? He says, for the next three years, you cannot ask me one question. I said, can I ask you a question before I agree to that condition? He said, yes. <laughs> I said, <laughs> I said, yes. He said, yes. He said, what's, he said, what's your question? I said, why can't I ask you any questions? I'll never forget what he said ever. He said, because you are a poor man and all that will come out of your mouth is poverty and scarcity. And you need to trust me and not doubt me. I, I mean, I was like, I had never heard that. He said, Luis, poor people are poor because they always talk about poverty. He said, wealth people are wealthy because they always declare what they want. He said, sick people are sick because they're always talking about their condition. They're always talking about their pathology. They're always talking about their disease. They're always talking about the next test they have to take. He said, healthy people are healthy, not because they never get sick, but because they don't declare what they don't want. He said, a word is a seed that's going to grow regardless. Good, bad, or indifferent. You are speaking your life right now. Every word that comes out of your mouth is going to become a reality. You, are, you have spoken where you are right now, right this moment. Oprah says, words are worlds, right? And I wrote that down, and I didn't ask him a question for three years. Every morning, seven days a week, he'd call me at 7 a.m. I had to be in my office at 7 a.m. My office opened at 8.30. And for one hour, he would speak to me. The first year, all he did was read the Bible from cover to cover. Cover to cover. I had, the, I, I had read the Bible, didn't understand the Bible. But he read the Bible and he explained it to me. Then the next two years, he read philosophy. I didn't know what philosophy was. I had never heard of philosophy. And he read philosophy. And then it happened. 28 years old. The end of the year came. And I'm just sharing this, not to boast, but I'm just sharing this because this is my time. Everyone has a testimony, right? I'm just sharing this. And when I was 28 years old, I made my first million in business. I've been a millionaire for about 25 years now. I made my first million in business. And I called him. I said, Doc, what, what happened? What did you do to me? He's like, do you not like it? I said, no, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love what you did to me. I just don't know what you did. I don't know what you did. He said, I changed your philosophy. I said, what does that mean? He said, Luis, he said, in life, there's a philosophy and science and art to life. He said, philosophy is what you think. Science is what you can duplicate, and art is you. It's the gifts. It's the direct gifts that God has put in your life. And for the last 27 years, I've been teaching philosophy to hundreds of thousands of people across the world. Because what I've realized is that most people don't have their own personal philosophy. Or they adopt someone else's philosophy. And Anne Rand says this. She said, when you take on someone else's philosophy, it won't work for you because that's their fault. It's like the dreams that God has given you. I've learned that when I, set, um, when I teach my team to set goals, I, don't, I say, don't take my goals because my goals are the goals God has given me, put me in my heart. My goals are my goals. You can't have my goals. You need to have your goals. You need to have your philosophy. Now, your philosophy may, may be similar to my philosophy. There, we may share common threads, but still, you need to know what is your philosophy about life? What is your philosophy about love? What is your philosophy about relationships? What is your philosophy about being a father, about being a husband, about being an entrepreneur? What's your philosophy about prosperity? What's your philosophy about personal development, about growth? Because that creates your self-identity. So philosophy. Philosophy is what we think. Okay? Very simply put, philosophy 
The love of knowledge, the search for wisdom. Philosophy is what you think, okay? Now, that is my passion. This simple word right here, this word right here is my passion, okay? That's my passion. I'll tell you why. Because if you understand this, and you can, if you make the decision to learn this, and you can, this will change your life forever. Today will be the day that you open up a new chapter in your life. Who would love to be a better father here? Who would love to be a better son? Who would love to be a better husband? Who would love to be a better entrepreneur, a better servant? Your mind your body, and your results. Thoughts are the language of your mind. Feelings are the language of your body. I repeat this again. Thoughts are the language of your mind. Feelings are the language of your body. You see, most men don't do what they know. They do what they feel. And as long as your body is a master and your mind is a servant, you will always fail in life. Because no one wants to wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Doesn't the pillow just feel more comfortable at 5 o'clock in the morning? Yes or no? Yes, yes or no? Yes? Don't you find that perfect spot at like 4.45 in the morning? Isn't it? Yes? No one says, oh my goodness, I can't wait to wake up. No one says that. But when, when that alarm goes off, your mind says, you got to get up. But your body says, no, just hit the snooze one more time. Just one more time. And then it says, hit the snooze just one more time again. And now, listen, write this down. If you win the morning, you win the day. If you win the morning, you win the day. Sorry, I keep pulling my pants. I just lost like 39 pounds. We were like really trying to be healthy so thank you it, it was hard it was hard it was really hard yeah because i love no I, i've been watching you guys eat those burritos i've already eaten five of them in my mind okay <laughs> they, it is very hard okay so what do you call it as long as we live by how we feel and not by what we think we will always fail okay our mind must be the master and our feelings our body must be the servant. That's why, it's, that's why I, I have something called the 20 20, 20 rule. That every single morning when I wake up, first 20 minutes, I do what's called MVP, meditate, visualize, and pray. The next 20 minutes, I do something to break my body down. And then the last 20 minutes, I do something called reflection. I reflect upon what I have to do in the day because if I can picture the perfect day, then I've already, I've, already, I've already accomplished it. Because I'm programming my mind, I'm dictating my thoughts. I'm, I'm stabilizing and fortifying my philosophy. Most people don't think anymore. I'm going to repeat this again. Most, and how, how do I know this? Well, you have 68,000 thoughts per day, okay? 68,000 thoughts per day. Who, can, who has a calculator? Who can divide 68,000 by 24, 24 hours? 68,000 divided by 24 equals what? 68,000 divided by 24. 2,833. Per hour, 2,833. And divide that by 60 minutes, please, if you could. So you have 47 thoughts a minute. Here's a thought. 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 You're, com you're completely unaware of it. But your mind is picking this up. Your mind is absorbing all this information. St statistically, they say this. Statistically. That by the time, check this out. When you are born, right? Your mind looks like this. There's something in, in, 
in human physiology called your genotype and your phenotype. Your phenotype, pheno, physical, that gives you your physical characteristics. Who here looks like their dad? A little more like their dad. Who here looks a little more like their mom? Yeah. So that means, that means you have the phenotype traits, those chromosomes when they came in, they came in, they came in a little bit more like dad. And for some of you, they came in a little bit more like mom, right? But how does this develop? The biology of thought. Now, what I'm, what I'm sharing with you is not my opinion. It is science. It is scientific facts about human physiology. Okay? So when you are born, your mind is all a subconscious. So everything that goes into your mind becomes a permanent program. I'll repeat this again. Everything that enters your mind is a permanent program. So how, what are the avenues that these things come in that form your thoughts? Well, they're your five senses. What you see, what you smell, what you taste, what you touch, what you hear. Those, through your five senses, everything comes into the subconscious and it forms what's called a paradigm. A paradigm is a group of programs that you function from. Does that make sense so far? Think of it this way. Um, who's here bought, who, here, who here has bought a, a laptop in the last year? Okay. And when you buy a laptop, what's, what, what, what's, when you open the screen, what do you usually see? Okay. Not, right, not many, though. There's just a couple. And then the first thing you're going to do is you're going to start downloading what? Download some, Download some applications, right? Yeah. That's your mind. When you're born, your mind is blank. And then you start don't downloading applications. Unfortunately, most of these, 99% of these programs occur between the ages of one to seven. Do you have a say so? Absolutely not. So everything that you see, smell, taste, touch, and hear comes in and forms a program. And something really interesting happens at the age of seven, it closes and it separates you. And now you have a subconscious and a conscious mind. Now, at the age of eight, you know you're not going to run into run into the middle of the street. You may be hurt. Now, at the age of eight, you know you're not going to touch that red hot pan because that you may you may be burnt. But when you're one, two, or three, you don't know that. But now you have all your paradigms, right, that you will use for the rest of your life. Ninety-eight percent of your of your thoughts, which produce your actions come from your paradigms that you were programmed with from the ages one to seven. Most people don't think for themselves. So if you take me, for example, what did I see? I saw fighting. What did I hear? I heard arguing. What did I feel? I felt fear and I felt pain. So these were all these unconscious, subconscious programs that I had. I didn't even know I had them. Until I met a person at the age of 24 that changed my philosophy. And he rebooted my mind. He rebooted my thought process. The book says, and forgive me, I'm not a Bible scholar, but I love to read. It says, do not conform your mind to that of the world, but transform. It says, transform. God knew. God knew that you had to renew your mind. It says, transform your mind. God knew that you were going to submit to lies. God knew that you were going to submit to fallacies. God knew that you were going to submit to mediocrity. God knew that you were going to submit to scarcity. God knew you were going to submit to divorce. I'm not judging. I'm just telling you. God knew you were going to submit to all this suffering. 
I'm not a Bible scholar. Pastor, where in the Bible does it say, thou shalt suffer? Oh, yeah, thou shalt suffer forever. No. Does it say, thou shalt suffer forever? No. Is, is there like a commandment that says, I need to suffer for the rest of my life? No. No. It's not. Joy is unmasked suffering. I repeat this again. Happiness is unmasked suffering. Henry David Thoreau says, when you come face to face with fear, the death of fear is certain. He says, when you uncover the layers of fear, all you will find is fear being afraid of itself. But we've been taught, we've been taught to stay away from fear. The only two fears we have when you're born, these are your only two innate fears. The fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. There are no other fears known to man. Everything else is learned. So we have learned how to be fearful. We have learned how to lie. We have learned how to neglect. We have learned how to, how to, choose, infi- how to choose infidelity. We have learned to be mediocre. We have learned how to have a job. We have learned to be on other people's time schedule. All those things are learned. Albert Einstein said, the illiterate person of the 21st century is not the person who cannot read or write. It is the person that, can, that cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. When you receive Christ into your life, you have to unlearn your life and relearn a better way. And that makes it so difficult for most people because this has become comfortable. This is what you know. Even in a bad relationship, who here knows a friend that's been in a bad relationship? I know you guys haven't, but maybe you have a good friend that's been in a bad relationship. And you're like, bro, that's just bad for you. Oh, but, but she cooks a while. I know, but that's just a bad relationship. They defend what they're familiar with. That's how we are. Right? Yet, yeah, Am I right or wrong? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I have a tendency of walking around. So, 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 therefore, so therefore, this is how our thoughts are formed. Okay? This is how our thoughts are formed. So the next step after philosophy is our attitude. Pastor talked about that. Our attitude. Now, our, your, your attitude is what you feel about what you think. So if we don't think for ourselves, then we're not going to feel good about ourselves, right? If, you, if we don't think for ourselves, then, then we're not going to desire sometimes to burn the candle at both ends. We're not going to desire to go the extra mile. We're not going to desire to go to that meeting. We're not going to desire to go to the church. We're not going to do what we're supposed to because we're not, we don't have clear thoughts. After attitude is action. Action is what you do about how you feel about what you know. I stopped telling people what to do, even, even employees, I stopped telling them what to do a long time ago. What I do is I ask them, what are they thinking? Because if I can change a person's thought process, and you can, then you will also change their actions. Right? If you create inspiration, we do what we hold at highest value. I'll repeat this again. We are inspired. We are self-inspired to do what we hold at highest value. And we need external motivation to do what we hold at lowest va- uh, value. I see Dodger fans. Did they win last night? No. Are you a big, who, who here is a Dodger fan? Like a real, like a diehard. Okay, good. Right? So if you know the Dodgers are in World Series and you're going to have a a World Series party, you're going to be inspired to wake up early. You're going to be inspired to go and get that delicious marinated carne asada, right? You're going to be inspired to clean the house, right? (laughs) Because you hold that at high value. But if you tell your child to clean the room just to clean the room, they're going to need a lot of different types of motivation. Right, <laughs> right. But but if you tell your child, Friday I'm taking you to Disneyland. No one will be at Disneyland. Everyone's going to be at school. Uh, you're not going to go to school Friday. I'm going to. I just need for you to fold your clothes this week. Oh, that clothes will be folded so perfect. <laughs> that night they're going to go to bed. They're going to put their shoes underneath their bed. They're going to lay out their clothing. Why? Because they're inspired by their highest values. So you want people to do things, work on their thoughts, not their actions. 
So, so it goes philosophy, attitude, actions. The next step is your results. Results is what you get from what you do about how you feel from what you know. Be careful. A lot of people get caught up with the result. Okay? That's why I'm just so thankful for the power of mentorship. I told you your greatest blessings come through the lives of other people. And I'm just so thankful that God has put people in my life like pastor, like other pastor friends that keep me accountable when I get results and keep me focused on my purpose, not the prosperity. Because purpose never ends. Who here, who here is a dad? Right? How old is your son? One is three and one is one year old. Oh, you're a young dad. Yes? And he's your son. And you're going to encourage him and inspire him and support him. Whether he's three, 13, 23, 33, 53, you're still going to be a dad. My son is here. Fabian, he's 21 years old. I look at Fabian as when he was five and six years old. The same love, the same encouragement. I'm not ever going to say, oh, you're 39? Then I'm not a dad anymore. Because <laughs> being a father is a purpose. Being a husband is a purpose. Serving Christ is a purpose. Personal development is a purpose. Personal growth is a purpose. Write this down. Man's purpose in life is to grow. Man's goal in life is to be happy. You're happiest when you're growing. I'm going to say this again. Man's purpose in life is to grow. Man's goal in life is to be happy. You are happiest when you are growing. When we see a one-year-old and we, we see that they're starting to walk and we come back and we see a five-year-old and now they can run, what if you can come back and, and there's a five-year-old that's, that's barely able to walk? You would think that there's something what? Wrong. So why don't we think that there's something wrong when we stop growing? That's good. Come on. That's good. Why don't we think there's something wrong when we're not a better husband than we were last year, when we're not a better entrepreneur than we were last year, when we're not serving more people than we were last year? Nowhere does it say, uh, you know, we're going to plateau. No, 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 no. Man's purpose is to grow mentally, physically, physiologically, spiritually, financially, in relationships, in community. That's man's purpose is to grow. And we are happiest when we are growing. If you've ever felt frustrated in your life, it's because you're stagnant. It's because you're stuck. And often we get stuck because we start getting stuff. And we become a little comfortable. Does that make sense? Philosophy, what you think. Attitude, what you feel. Action, what you do. Result, what you get from what you do, from how you feel about what you think. And la last one is lifestyle. And that is what you become. Okay? That is what you become. Jim Rohn says this, success, and you can define success however you want. But he says, success is not something that you chase after. Success is not something that you work towards. Success is something that you attract by the person that you become. That's what he said. You don't run after success. You attract success. You become that person of value in the community. Yes? And when you become that person of value, you can demand what you want when you become that person of value. Yes? This is a beautiful location. They're buying another building to, you know, they're progressing. Yes. They've, they've graduated. Yeah. Too many people have, too many men haven't graduated yet. I'm going to give you seven keys to graduation in the next session, right? Yes. Yeah, in the next session. Yes. Okay. Because we need to, gra I need to graduate. My prayer every night with my wife is, Lord, help me to be a better husband, a better father a better son, a better leader every day. Forgive me for my transgressions. And tomorrow, I want to be better than today. I want to be bolder than today. I want my roar to be louder 
tomorrow than today. Does that make sense to you? Yes? So when you become, you stop thinking. You just are. Okay? So now you are this individual emitting all this unbelievable energy. Have you ever seen somebody walk into a room and you feel them before you see them? It's called command presence. Okay? You are emitting energy all the time. Nikolai Tesla talked about this. He talked about the power of the FEV, the power of the frequency, energy, and vibration. So he said this. He said, you're emitting energy all day long. He said, energy is not bought, taught, or sought. Energy is caught. Energy is not bought, taught, or sought. Energy is caught. We are energy magnets. We are attracted to higher energy. He said, you put out this energy, right? You put out this energy in the form of a vibration. And this vibration looks to connect with a frequency in the universe, positive or negative. So if we're not becoming, then we don't have the energy necessary to fulfill God's plans for our life. So we're vibrating at a lower level and we're connecting with the lower level frequency. So what's at the lower level frequency? We wake up late. We spill coffee in ourselves. We get a ticket. Someone cuts us off. Yes. We forgot to do something at work and we're like, gosh, this is a bad day. No, you created that bad day. You put out that energy, right? But what if you become intentional? But what if you decide today? I know some of you, may be going through a massive challenge right now. Some of you may be just barely holding on. You have the power to change the energy in your life right now. It's a power decision. It's making a decision. For yourself, not for me, not for your wife, not for your kids. It's the power of making a decision for yourself to be the person that God has called you to be. God has big plans for you. God doesn't, he didn't make you just to pay your bills. He didn't make you just to get by. He, He didn't create you for that. He created you for something miraculous. The worst thing in business is when people set small goals and they hit them. I'd rather you set big goals and miss than small goals and hit them. Because when you hit small goals and hit them, you you have this vibe, you have this frequency that you've arrived. I'm telling you right now, man, when some of us connect, we won't have 140 men. We we'll have 14,000 men. Why not? God's not a respecter of people. If someone else did it, why can't we? If someone else is living it, why can't we? If someone else is driving it, why can't we? If someone else is preaching it, why can't we? The difference is that they DBA. They declare it, believe it, and accept it every day. I don't know the verse, but it goes something like this. Pastor, you can help me think on these things. Think on the things that are... Uh, could you say it? Yeah. Uh, set your mind on things that are just, lovely and good to yeah. Set your mind on things that are just, that are loving, that are beautiful, that are kind. And a g- yes, that's a decision that we have to make every single day. So the next session, I'm going to give you seven keys on how to elevate your energy and be that person value. I'm not talking about just, I mean, God loves us all, and I understand we are all equal, but we're also playing a game called life. Does that make sense? I hope and pray that some of these concepts, I hope you enjoyed them, and uh, it it is truly my honor 
Thank you, Pastor Mauricio, for this opportunity. And thank you all very much.